Hello and welcome to this presentation on Game Masters and the Aesthetics of Play, How to Engage Players with Varied Interests. This is a presentation that I gave at LTUE 2020, and I thought uh, it would be useful to get it recorded and up on YouTube uh, ahead of LTUE 2021 coming this weekend. Now, the purpose of this uh, frame, this uh, presentation is to talk about the aesthetics of play in particular and how we can recognize those in our players and how to honor each of those aesthetics in different aspects of our campaign as game masters. Um, and to begin with, we're going to be talking about the MDA framework that the aesthetics of play come from in order to give uh, some context to this discussion. So the MDA framework was developed by um, some academic researchers who wanted the ability to analyze games academically and determine what makes them what they are. And it was really the, the first attempt to, try to officially categorize um, games in a way that would allow us to understand why players enjoy the games that they do. And so they made this framework where they look at the mechanics, the dynamics, and the aesthetics of the game. The mechanics of the game are kind of the level where the designer interacts with the game, the numbers and the rules. In a video game, these mechanics are all but invisible to the player of the game. However, in Dungeons and Dragons, the players see these uh, these mechanics directly. Maybe not all of them. Some of your, your homebrew mechanics and, and special things for modules may be more hidden from the players, but you as the GM at least are seeing them. And so these are the things that you control or that you get from the, the core rule books to help your to the, the game runs on. These are the, the fact that you're rolling dice to get your random numbers, that you have, you know, your strength, your constitution, dexterity, intelligence, wisdom, charisma, your hit points, your spell slots, how rests work, how you recover, saving throws, attack rolls, class features, all of those things fall under mechanics. The dynamics are how these mechanics come together to form an, a scenario. Uh, so I've written an example here that has a lot of mechanics thrown in there. The totem warrior barbarian with totem of the bear takes his turn in the initiative order. He uses his movement to run in a corner where a mage casts fireball as a reaction, having called an action the turn before. He makes a dexterity saving throw at advantage due to his danger sense. He succeeds and takes half damage, half again due to his bear totem rage. The damage is 8d6 divided by 4 and rounded down. So all of these mechanics, the, the fact that there's half damage from the bear totem, the danger sense giving advantage, the ability to call an action, the ability to use your movement, the ability to cast fireball at all on the part of the mage, dexterity saving throw, these are all mechanics that have come together in this scene lots and lots of mechanics to create um, this moment. But that moment is just something that supports the experience the player is actually there for. No one comes to the table in order to take one-fourth damage from a fireball with their barbarian. That's not what drove them to come to the table. What they actually came to the table to experience are the aesthetics of the game. So the MDA framework, they divide out the aesthetics of games into four different types of experiences that the player is coming to look for. There's the sensation, which is coming to be stimulated um, visually and all these other senses. Fantasy is the game is make-believe. You're here there to pretend to be someone else. Uh, these are the types of games where you really just are enjoying the experience of being someone in a different situation. Narrative, game is drama. This is the, uh, where there's a, a strong story running through the game. Challenge, game is obstacle course. These are the players who are looking for a game to, to challenge them personally, where they are trying to overcome obstacles. Fellowship, game is social framework. These are the games where you're there just to be there with your friends. And this, I think, applies to all RPGs and all campaigns. Um, if you're not there for fellowship, then there's lots of other games that can, can serve you very well while lacking that fellowship element. And so it 
at least to some extent, I think anyone coming to an RP a tabletop RPG is looking for fellowship. Discovery is game is uncharted territory, so this is um, where you enjoy games by because of what you uh, discover throughout the game. You enjoy having mystery and, and going out to find the things behind that. And then expression, game is self-discovery. So this is where you find enjoyment in learning things about yourself and in showing uh, who you are. And then finally, submission, game is pastime. Um, and this is where you enjoy the game simply because it allows you to pass the time. And so in this discussion, we're not going to talk about sensation and submission so much. Um, partly because for submission, because when a player comes to your table for submission, you don't need to do anything to satisfy that desire. Um, they're going to get that one way or the other. And sensation, because I feel that game masters have enough to do without feeling like they need to be building terrain and getting smoke machines and maybe playing a little music there, but, but I really am not going to be gearing my discussion toward how to um, improve the sensation experience of players who, who come for that. I feel like players looking for that are going to be better served by other types of games. All right, so as we begin looking at what it looks like to be a GM and, and consider the aesthetics of play, it's important to know your own tendencies. So as you are preparing for your next session or, or think back on the last session that you prepared for, think about where your focus is. If you are imagining what a scene is going to look like as your players arrive on it, if you have a, a, an image in your head, uh, then you may be focused on fantasy. And that means that it's going to be easier for you to satisfy those players who are fantasy players and are um, looking for that same experience. If you have a, a story in mind that you're hoping will unfold and you have to resist the temptation to railroad your players, that means that you're probably strong and natural in the narrative aesthetic, in which case uh, players coming to your table looking for that are going to be satisfied by that for that with that without necessarily you having to exert a lot of extra effort. If you are excited uh, to know how the players are going to solve problems and you don't necessarily have solutions to those problems, but you've laid these puzzles out and you know that the players are going to be running into them and, and that's what you get excited about, then it's possible that a uh, challenge comes naturally to you. And so as your players are coming to the table looking for challenge, you're not going to need to put in a lot of extra effort to satisfy that need. Uh, if you come as you're preparing for the session are just excited that everyone's going to be there and you're just going to be happy to, to see everybody, then that means that you're naturally tending toward that fellowship side and, and you naturally are going to support the types of behaviors that fellowship players are going to bring to the table. If you're excited to see what the players think as they explore, if you like to see the, the look of realization on their face and see them realize, oh, of course, the magical fruit is causing the lycanth lycanthropy. There's no werewolf out here biting people. It's because they use this magical fruit to cook the wolves and eat them. And you are excited to see that moment, then discovery probably comes naturally to you. And, and it's going to be easy for you to satisfy that. And then expression, if you're excited to play all of the NPCs because you are yourself an expression player and, and you like to self-discover as you play through these NPCs, that part's going to come naturally to you and you're going to be probably more capable of empathizing with, uh, with your players who have a similar desire. Now it's p possible that rather than empathizing with them, um, that you are on the other side of things and, and tend to steal the show and that's something to look out for. But as we look at these tendencies and know ourselves, we can better know where we're going to need to put extra focus to overcome where we may be weak in our support of the aesthetics of play in our role-playing games. So now that we've considered how we can recognize these in ourselves, let's think about how we can recognize what aesthetics are important to our players. So fantasy players are gonna be players who come to the table wanting to be that character. They want to be the mage. They want to be the warrior. And so they want 
there to be a lot of immersion. They're going to be frustrated when talk comes above the table and and when metagaming is happening and when uh, there are distractions to talk about you know the latest video game that another player is playing that something in the scene reminded them of. And they're also going to expect their character to be the one solving the problems rather than themselves. If you've had a player come up to a puzzle and say, well, can't my super intelligent magic user just roll an intelligence check to solve this puzzle? That's coming from a fantasy aesthetic mindset. And understanding that helps us realize that they aren't coming to the table looking for um, puzzles for themselves to solve. They're coming to the table looking to be this other character. Um, and that neither approach is wrong, right? One is it, we may not understand it if we're more of a challenged dungeon master and we have a fantasy player, we, it's, it can be hard to identify with their desire to have their character be the one solving the problem. Um, they'll tend to play characters that mimic um, someone that they admire from popular fiction, right? They, if, if a fantasy player, if a player comes to the table and you can tell that they've done the best they can with the mechanics they have to build Superman, then you know that they are looking for the, that experience of being Superman, right? They saw a movie or a TV show recently and they think, wow, that was so cool. I want to recreate that. And they're also going to strongly visualize their character moments. I had a player, I didn't realize that he was a fantasy player for a long time. We'd been playing together for years. And then there was a moment where all his character was doing in that moment was holding someone else steady as the ship broke apart around them so that they could cast, um, they could finish their, their ritual on the altar that they had built inside the ship. And so his character, I thought, was playing a small role. And, and for a moment, I felt like he needed more of a spotlight there. Um, but after we had moved out of that scene, he retold that story multiple times because he had visualized so strongly the, the ship falling apart as his character was, was studying this other character. And that was when I realized that fantasy in the game was really important to that player, something that I had missed for a long time. Uh, players who come to the table looking for narrative are going to be expecting things to move more linearly than, than maybe other players are looking for. Now they might be able to appreciate the plot of their, their character's growth. Oh, and I should make a note that these players are increasingly common in the tabletop role-playing community. The community has grown significantly um, since fifth edition was released. And that's in large part due to the many high quality actual play podcasts with, with um, skilled actors and, um, prepared plots, and so the players coming from from those actual play podcasts to look into Dungeons and Dragons are coming expecting that narrative, right? They enjoyed the narrative that was in those podcasts, and they're coming expecting to see that recreated at their table. And so there's increasingly more players coming for this aesthetic. So you may be able to recognize these players when they're speculating about what's going to happen next when they don't like that something is distracting from the, the the main plot that the campaign seems to be following. And when they are telling stories that branch across multiple sessions, uh, the example I gave in the fantasy of the fantasy player, he was telling the story of a single scene, right? Where his character got to, to shine and where he was able to visualize that the narrative player, they're not visualizing themselves as the character, but they are invested in the story as it goes on. And so they're going to be looking for and, and possibly pointing out where the story makes sense over multiple sessions. Uh, challenge players, and, and these are, um, are going to be common from people who have been playing the game for a long time. But also many people coming in thinking that they, they want a new challenge. And so that you're going to be able to recognize these players because they're going to like situations where there's risk. They're going to love combat, especially when the combat gets hard is where you're going to see them engaged heavily, right? So anytime that a, a fight is um, looking difficult, and not just because they got unlucky, right, but because you're really pushing them, they're going to 
to really get engaged, and that's when how you might know that there's a challenge player. They're not going to shy away from using meta knowledge and, and meta discussion to solve problems because they're here to solve the problems, right? They're not here for the immersion. They're not here. Oh, and this is probably too late to note that players have multiple aesthetics, right? So when I say they're not here for the immersion, that's not to say that there doesn't exist a fantasy challenge player who's here both for immersion and to solve puzzles. But if, um, if you have a player who's using every resource at their disposal, including optimized character builds to be able to solve the problems that are before the party, then that may indicate that they are interested in the challenge, right? They may even be willing to, to rules lawyer as much as they can to get whatever advantage they can get. And, and that's going to be an indication of a challenge player at your table. Now, fellowship players, um, can be easy to recognize. I play with a lot of teenagers and some of them I can tell are definitely there as fellowship players primarily. They're going to potentially arrive with someone else. Like they're there just to be with this friend and not necessarily because of their, their interest in the game itself. Um, they're going to enjoy chatting before the game. They're gonna linger to chat after the game. And one of the biggest times when they're going to engage is when they're going to be able to participate in hijinks. Um, stealing other players' equipment just for the laughs, not because they're super greedy, right? Um, not telling other players things just to, to see them fall into the same trap again. And, and things that most of the humor at your table is going to be appealing to this fellowship player. Um, I won't say all. Um, when we get to expression, there there's some opportunity for humor there. But fellowship is a big part is it's going to be pretty easy to recognize in players who are clearly just there to have fun with their friends and as i said before almost all players are going to have some aspect of fellowship that they're looking for i haven't met a D, &D player who comes to the table doesn't want to talk to anybody else there and just wants to get in and start uh grinding through things right everyone's going to be able to recognize a funny situation and laugh a little bit, but there are going to be some players where this is the real reason that they're here is because it's an opportunity to enjoy a time with, with one of their friends who enjoys the game possibly for other reasons. Uh, discovery players, are, you're going to be able to recognize discovery players because they are trying to solve whatever mystery you have. Even if you don't have a mystery in your campaign, they are looking for it because that's why they're here. They want to know. Um, why what the crystals scattered throughout your world are for um, one player that I knew immediately was was this type of player. Um, there was there were magical crystals in the first arc of the campaign and they became aware that this was one type of crystal and they'd been initiated into its knowledge and they, the rest of the campaign were obsessed with finding the rest of the crystals. So I had to weave those crystals deeper into the campaign than I had originally intended. And so these players you're going to be able to recognize because they're taking notes, they're asking questions, they're looking everywhere they can to try to get the information that they so crave about your world because that is what they came here to do, is explore the, the scenario that you've created. And then expression players are can be easy to recognize because they're really there um, trying to learn something about themselves through their character. So they're going to have a wide variety of characters. They may draw pictures of their characters to show, look, this is this is my character. They're going to have in-game artifacts, journals, stones. Um, gave this presentation a year ago. I don't remember. I remember two reasons why stones was on this list and that was um, players had painted some rocks that were talking rocks that their characters had um, found throughout the course of their dungeons and so they painted some faces on rocks that they brought to every session and that made me realize that they were, were interested in this expression and, and being connected to their character in a self-discovery kind of way they may use a character voice um, as a as a part of this experimentation and self-discovery 
and they are likely to build their characters for um, not so much for mechanical efficiency, but more for exploring what they can do with the mechanics, um, trying to to create these interesting situations where they're doing something suboptimal, but that they find fun because they're expressing themselves through the manipulation of the mechanics. So those are how we're going to recognize the six aesthetics in our players. I'm going to take a moment here and talk about pacing and the engagement curve. So your engagement curve, you want to have um, highs and lows throughout there. You can't, you don't want to be high all the time. If you think of the, the plot of uh, your favorite movies, you're going to find that they have high points where the action is, is high and you're, you're highly engaged and then low points where you get to relax a little bit and recover before the next one. And that those points are going to escalate and fall throughout the movie and then, and then um, have the resolution at the end. So the same thing can happen at our tables with, with well-planned sessions. However, because we are trying to engage so many aesthetics and players don't have the same aesthetic interests, um, we need to recognize that they're going to have different engagement curves through the course of, of the game here. And that's okay. In fact, it may even be desirable because it means that you can throw the spotlight on different players at different times and still have them be at a good place in the engagement curve. So I've, I've drawn these scribbles down below here and these represent two players and their engagement curve in the in over the course of a session. If we look here, um, we can see that they both are engaged here at the climax and we do want um, the climax to engage as many players as possible. So I'm going to go ahead and imagine that this green player is um, kind of a narrative challenge player and that the red player is a challenge uh, discovery player. And so we can see as the, the session starts, um, our narrative player is very high because he's now getting the quest hook and he's, he's learning about the story, what's going on. And he drops down as we enter, as we start to explore and try to find our way to the dungeon. And the, the discovery player is now enjoying that. Oh, and then we find a, a narrative heavy puzzle at the front of the dungeon. And the narrative player sees a little bit of a peak there. And both challenge players are, are getting excited about this, uh, this puzzle the discovery player becomes even more excited because suddenly the puzzle reveals something about the world. And so we can see how, and then this this climactic battle at the end where the, the discovery player falls off a little bit faster as the battle comes to an end, but the narrative player stays engaged as, as they learn something else about the narrative after the battle. And then again is engaged in the resolution here. And so you can see how different players with different interests would be engaged in different situations. And we can use this to our advantage by allowing the players who are not engaged, who have different interests to be in the spotlight during the times when, when we're attempting to engage their interest while the other ones are getting a bit of a rest and a reprieve from the last time that their interest was, was heavily engaged. And this greatly com complicates uh, pacing above and beyond what what is needed for a linear written story, but it's an opportunity for us to, to craft an enjoyable experience for all of our players. So I'm going to talk about eight situations where we can think about how we can use these aesthetics to engage different players in these situations. And we're just going to start right in on that. So in session zero, this is the session where you get together with the players you're crafting your characters, you're introducing the world in this situation and uh, making sure that you have everyone's buy-in for the campaign. And so it's, it's, it is important during session zero that you have engaged everyone at your table. So we're gonna talk about all of these. Um, for the fantasy player, you wanna make sure you establish the genre so they really understand. Are they getting into a low magic world? Is there gonna be um, lost technology in this world that makes sense? Or is there for some reason um, gunpowder in this magical fantasy world so that they can craft their character to fit in the world because as they 
craft that character, that's the character that they intend to identify with for the course of your campaign. And if their character doesn't fit in the world, then they're always going to have kind of a, a raw, tender, um, nagging at the back of their mind as they play this character because they just don't fit in, right? If they're the only character um, using a rifle in your entire world, right? Or if they're the only source of magic in your world, they're going to think, well, this just doesn't make a lot of sense. And the narrative player, this is the prologue for them, right? So um, this is where they're going to understand how the story is going to progress. This is their starting point, right? And so this is the session zero is just as, as important to the narrative player as a prologue is in a book, and, and it needs to explain to them where everything is starting. For the challenge player, now they they may zone out a little bit here in session one, right? So you've got to have the promise for them that there's going to be um, challenges fit for the power of their character. And that promise is going to come by paying attention to what they're building, right? As you look at what they're building and they can tell that you're paying attention, they're going to know, oh yeah, he's, he's ready to challenge me with this campaign. And you're gonna to wanna to be paying attention so that you can be ready to challenge um, that player in particular with the right types of situations that they get to really shine in, as well as situations where they have to dig a little bit deeper to overcome something that, that counters what they were prepared for. Um, for a fellowship in session one, you may want to consider something like a bond system. Now, the, the fellowship players may just be happy to be there with their friends, but some of these bond systems that exist in um, fate or even just something that you make up on your own, where you start out with session zero explaining how all the characters are linked to each other, can be very helpful to that, getting that fellowship uh, player to buy in for the, the long haul across these campaigns. Uh, the discovery player, they're at this point, they want to know what is the mystery that I'm trying to solve? What, Where is my starting point on this? Where's the thread that I'm about to start pulling on? So it's important to establish that there are things that they don't know about this world as you're coming into session zero. And finally, expression. Um, this is the time when they're making that character and they're deciding who that character is going to be and, and what their goals are going to be and how they're going to express themselves over the course of this campaign. And so they'll be engaged when they see that you are interested and aware of their goals and, and that you, they have that promise that you're going to uh, fulfill the, the aspirations that they have. And this isn't a promise that they're going to be able to do everything that they want to do, but it is a promise that you're going to care and give them a chance to try. So hooks, the when uh, you're just getting your players to accept the, the quest that they're on, so these could be hooks for the whole campaign or it could be hooks for a small side quest of any kind. Um, to engage your players during this time, we're going to talk about fantasy. You want to be using voices, maybe some sound effects are going to help them to, to be immersed, right? You're going to use your tone to convey the setting and that's going to help them accept that, okay, yes, this quest really is part of the, the world. And I say voices, voices can also um, be off-putting to fantasy players when they are too cliched, right? When they're too over the top, um, I'd say voices engage fantasy players, but if you come in and you've got the, the wise elf that they're getting the quest from um, and you're using your best goofy voice to convey that quest, they're not going to take that seriously, right? That, that could be harmful to the fantasy players' engagement there. And so it's something to be careful with. But the tone you use is going to help that fantasy player believe that this quest is a, a real thing. Um, narrative players with the hook are going to be looking for characters that are going to be playing a role. Uh, they're going to be looking for foreshadowing and the types of story elements that you get early in a story to, to be present so that they can know that there's a story ahead. Um, challenge players are really 
going to engage on that hook if there's a chance that things could go completely wrong right off the bat. And so uh, as an example, I have a module sentient skies where one of the hook options is a crashed ship where aliens are attacking this crashed ship and the players need to get there as quickly as possible. And there's immediately a chance that the NPC that they're trying to rescue in the, in this hook is uh, going to be killed. And so there's a chance of failure. The party itself is probably going to be okay. Um, we don't want to TPK during the, the hook there, but we do want to, for the challenge player indicate that this there's going to be challenges along the way here and it's not going to just be a cakewalk where no matter what you do you succeed for the fellowship players um they're going to engage more when they see that oh okay this hook is building upon the the rapport that we've all built together when you call back to prior experiences and or use an inside joke or refer to something that, that everyone recognizes and, and has a little chuckle, that's going to help engage the fellowship players. Discovery players um, are going to like the hook when it are, are more likely to bite on a hook that says well, there's going to be something more coming. Yeah, there's there's a loose end here that you don't understand, the, and that's going to make it more likely for a player who enjoys discovery to want to follow up on the, the hook that you've given. And finally, expression players are, they're looking for opportunities to, to show their character to everyone else during the hook, right? Especially if this is the hook for the main campaign or for a one shot. Um, this is the moment when they are first showing their character and you're gonna want to, to give them that opportunity to describe their character to the other players so that they know that, that who their character is and who they're uh, portraying matters to the table. Um, it's not, okay. So in combat encounters, um, fantasy players are going to be more engaged with the combat encounter if it's an opportunity for their player to shine and it feels real, right? So you're gonna to wanna to vividly describe what they're up against, right? And so that they, when they are visualizing in their mind, um, their character attempting to cross this bridge as they're attacked by feral monkeys with glowing eyes, they're gonna to want to be able to visualize that. And so the more um, vivid your description, the more that they know what the, the breath of the monkey smells like and, and what the sound of the creaking bridge is, the more that they're going to be able to engage with that um, with that combat scenario and really visualize their character in there. Uh, narrative, it's going to be important that the location of the fight and the enemies in the fight are consistent with your world, right? If, if um, it makes absolutely no sense for there to be a massive uh, stone golem here in these uh, completely natural caves filled with, filled with goblins, then they're, they're going to be a little disappointed unless there is a narrative reason for that, uh, that enemy to be there. And even then, uh, the mystery of it is going to appeal more to discovery players unless it is revealed fairly soon to the narrative player. So for challenge players, there needs to be consequences. There needs to be, needs to be absolutely clear that everything they do is using up resources um, potentially causing damage. Uh, if you're at a table where you don't like to kill the players or, or have much chance of that, then there's always the, the possibility that they have allies with them, that they that it's clear that something harder is going to be harder in the future, that they're going to miss out on something as a result of this combat not going um, as smoothly as, as they would have liked. For fellowship players, um, hijinks should have a chance to succeed. Um, you don't want to go too far with this, right? But if if a uh, player says that they're going to, I had a player, they were fighting um, some living mushrooms on a staircase. And he said that he wanted to be like Mario and jump on top of one of these mushrooms. And so I said, well, absolutely, that should have a chance to succeed. We're going to do a body weight um, 
wield object, improvised weapon kind of a, an attack with your body weight and see what happens. And so he had his chance to succeed. And even in failure, as long as there was that chance to succeed, the fellowship player will be pleased with these hijinks. That player um, did his damage but didn't couldn't stick the landing and fell down the stairs. And the, the hijinks, even the failure of that hijinks attempt caused him greater enjoyment in that in that session because he was rolling around on the floor trying to get away as as he was in the midst of these flaming mushrooms because somebody else cast a fireball down there. And so they just need a chance to succeed. And if even if they don't succeed, that player will still be engaged by the fact that their hijinks were uh, a part of the play there. Um, discovery. So discovery players are going to be looking for the enemies that they're combating or the, the scene that they're in to have something else to offer. Maybe there's a door that they can lock to stop reinforcements from arriving. Maybe there's a chandelier that can be cut to fall down on the enemy. Maybe the opponent has a soft spot if uh, if they're looking around. And this may be a, a big tell actually for discovery players is the first thing they do in a combat is, is um, in the eyes of challenge players, waste their turn making a perception check to try to learn more about the enemy where the, the more challenge engaged player is thinking we should just fight this thing. The discovery player is thinking, well, maybe we can beat it by getting some more information. And so you're gonna want that to pay off when you have discovery players at your table. Think about ways when you're building a, a combat encounter that there can be something new for them to realize about the, the venue or the enemy that they can exploit. Um, expression players are gonna want to have some more flavor in their attacks, right? So that they're not just going to make an attack roll. They're going to try to sever the enemy's arm. And so go ahead and let them do that, right? And if the damage is right, describe that the arm is severed, sure. Um, there's no reason to, to hamper that, um, that desire. It really makes you um, appreciate some of these systems that have like the, the deed die from Dungeon Crawl Classics that allow these warriors to describe things like that and, and have them have an impact mechanically. But you can always allow that regardless of the mechanics of your game. And also, uh, if there's multiple ways to approach the, the combat situation or even alleviate the combat situation, those will appeal to your expression player. Social encounters. Uh, so social encounters are going to appeal to fantasy players when they believe it, right? When they believe that they're really talking to this person. A fantasy player is going to enjoy a social encounter even if it's going really badly, if they really believe that the person they're talking to would be opposing them. Um, but they're also going to expect to be able to make skill checks to get through some of those problems. Um, they're, they're going to want to make that insight check if they think the person is lying to them rather than than uh, try to press it out of them on their own. Uh, the narrative player in a social encounter is going to be expecting this to, to move things forward. Right? If, if it's just kind of a useless conversation, that's going to be a, a real low point for the narrative player, which again, it's okay to have low points during your campaigns uh, to keep that, that pacing and that uh, engagement curve bumping up and down. So if you're trying to engage a narrative player with your social encounter, you, you're going to want them to be able to see how this conversation is um, is moving the plot forward. And it, it could be that the conversation is moving the, the plot forward because the discovery player is really engaged with, with pulling the clues out of the, the conversation. But that narrative player doesn't need to be engaged by the clues, but he needs to believe that someone else at least is is grabbing onto this information that is going to move something forward and make the, the story continue. The challenge player is going to love it when when there's some work to do to get things out of these PCs, right? Um, whether the PC is uncooperative and needs to be convinced, and that you need to come up with with an incentive for them to to work with you or whether the their the NPC is incompetent or speaks in riddles, those are things that are gonna make the challenge player think, okay, 
there's a chance that we're missing something here and I really need to be engaged to, to solve this problem. Um, fellowship players are going to love it when the, when the, the whole party is engaged in the conversation. Right? They're not going to like it. They're, well, they may like it as long as it's an intended low point for them, right? But they're going to disengage when the, there's just one player going back and forth with, with the, the character. Um, and if that one player is the fellowship player, often they'll try to rope another character into the conversation, which is very helpful. But if they're, you're conversing with someone who's not that fellowship player, then they will become disengaged and, and usually miss a lot of the information that is being presented if, uh, if they're not directly drawn in by the character. Discovery. Um, so I mentioned during narrative that you're, during these social encounters, you're going to be dropping clues and leaving uh, more loose ends for the discovery to character to, to follow. And this could be fairly easy to do if by having, um, having the character they're talking to use slang terms and such that are unusual, uh, that are special to your world that they don't know about that they're going to want to follow up on, right? And they may follow up on during that conversation or, or somewhere else. Um, but also just clues in general can be easy to drop during a social encounter. And then expression players are going to really engage when they realize that your NPC is recognizing something about their character. Right? If they've told you that, um, that they have blue hair and the NPC says, oh, how unusual your hair color is, then they're going to, to realize, oh, this character is talking to my character who I care about, right? Because they do, they care about their character. And if you demonstrate that this NPC also cares, then that's going to increase their engagement. And obviously there's better ways to do that than, than commenting on their hair. Uh, puzzle encounters. Uh, I've mentioned early on that puzzle encounters can be difficult for fantasy players or fan players who favor a fantasy aesthetic because they want their character to solve problems. They're not there to solve problems on their own necessarily. And so uh, using character skills as a way to advance your way through the, the puzzle can really help. Um, if the stakes are believable for the puzzle, if it makes sense that the puzzle would be in this situation, that can also help a lot. Um, and also uh, props can help make it, uh, make it feel more real to them and make it easier for them to visualize what's going on with the puzzle and why the puzzle is there. Narrative players, it's really hard to tell a story with a puzzle. Not going to lie, um, but if they can see that the, the puzzle is part of their progress forward and it's relatively brief, they may stay engaged for the puzzle, or it may be an engagement low for them, and that, that can be okay. Uh, challenge players, there needs to be a consequence for failure. And the hard thing about consequences for failure with puzzles is uh, when it's binary, right? When you say, nope, you got the puzzle wrong, and now the whole cave collapses and everyone's dead. That's rough for the whole party, right? And so having a chance for failure for challenge players ideally means that there's gradations of success, meaning that if they get it correct the first time, whoo, full success, right? Now you've got this great advantage for the rest of the dungeon. Oh, it took two tries. Well, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, you, you're just going to have to do without that advantage. Three tries, ooh, now there's a bit of a disadvantage. And so that, that can present the consequences without... Um, being completely uh, binary in the outcome of the puzzle. I had an example come to mind, but I've forgotten. In any case, the amount of resources used by the puzzle, having, having a gradation, oh, that's what it was. Uh, I had a dungeon with some puzzles in it that provided keys to get on through the next part of the dungeon. And the gradation of success there was that uh, each time you failed, one of these keys would be destroyed, but there were multiple keys available at each puzzle, which allowed the players to think, okay, well, we, we can't fail this many times, but we can experiment a little bit. Uh, fellowship. Um, one of the great things for fellowship with these puzzles is when you can have something physical that, that 
causes the the players to lean forward into the table and lean over this puzzle and look close because it's really easy to feel close when you're physically close. Now, current conditions can make this difficult. And so I've actually reduced my use of puzzles um, in part because of how difficult it is to portray them in a digital media uh, and, and have that effect of bringing people closer together. Um, but also collective input. If, uh, if every player, if different players have different knowledge that their character can contribute to the puzzle, if it's something that that takes multiple people, uh, maybe levers in different parts of the room that, that everyone has to be engaged. Uh, the fellowship player is going to enjoy that that feeling of camaraderie and teamwork and, and become more engaged. Um, discovery, uh, I say world revelations. And what I mean by that is there's there's this whole range of puzzle types that are common where there's a picture. Uh, and with it, you're trying to rearrange in some way to, to recreate the, the full picture. And those pictures can be, you know, a tapestry or a painting or something from the world that reveals something new about your world, right? Maybe when they, they finish it, they realize, oh my goodness, this tapestry is depicting when the giants drove the aliens from the world. We didn't know that the giants had driven the aliens from the world. That's amazing. And, and so that's going to engage the discovery player when they get to the end of that puzzle and realize, well, not only has this puzzle opened this door that lets me go into the, the dungeon and discover what's in this dungeon, but it also told me something about the world when I was done solving the puzzle automatically. And then expression players, uh, to, to satisfy the expression player, you're going to want to be flexible in, in how the puzzle can be solved because they're there to, to express themselves and, and discover themselves. And as they, do that they, they need room to to stretch moving right along here uh, so I'm going to talk about the the course of the whole campaign um, for fantasy players they're there pretending to be an adventurer right and they become engaged with the campaign as a whole when they can see that their character and that the party are um, having the impact that adventurers should have. And, and part of that is fame. Um, so as they are able to, to build strongholds and uh, become famous and have a, a reputation in the world, that is where the fantasy player is going to be engaged across your whole campaign. Narrative players, uh, it's easy to explain, uh, hard for me to execute on, but having a plot across your campaign that has a beginning and a middle and an end helps those fantasy players to to follow along uh, or, or sorry, helps those narrative players to to be engaged across the whole campaign as they can see that things are are starting out and coming to a head and finally resolving themselves um and that can be hard to achieve in the types of sandbox campaigns that i prefer to run um but there, there's still things that you can do to engage that that narrative player on a campaign level by having stories string together. Uh, the challenge player is wants there to be stakes, real, real stakes, like not, uh, oh, the world will end if we don't succeed. No, if, if uh, the world is going to end if we don't succeed, is that a real stake? Is the world really going to end? Are we going to, is he going to allow us to fail at that level? And so these stakes need to be something that that your players trust are, are real and apparent opportunities for failure. It, whether that's, you know, the, this village ends up being slaughtered, but you guys triumph in the end um, types of things that they can prevent, that will engage them over the course of the campaign as they realize, no, the actions that we're taking in this imaginary world make a difference. Um, over the course of the campaign, leave lots of room for those fellowship players to to have fun together right they're, they're there to tell jokes to each other and and uh, build that camaraderie and so leave room for that there's no need to to be going hard all the time if you can fit in a, a down session a, a town session downtime uh, between adventures that's a great time for for these fellowship players to 
that really get their payoff. Uh, discovery, over the course of your campaign, discovery players are looking for that ball of thread, the, the threads they've been pulling on to, to really unfold and unroll and to be able to continue discovering things. And then finally, expression players. Um, I use, I say, wrap the campaign or events around the players. And that's not completely necessary. It's not necessarily what I mean to say is that your players need, should, their character backstory should be what the campaign is about, but their character choices should end up mattering to the story. Um, I really, I wonder sometimes if I'm a heavy expression player based on some of my own behaviors, because I wouldn't have said that I was. But I remember a campaign where the dungeon master, my character was a librarian who wanted to become an adventurer. And I had no expectation that the campaign would be wrapped around my player, my character. And it was really mostly wrapped around another character who had no interest in that happening. But um, as the campaign progressed, he provided opportunities in that campaign for my character to become the legendary hero that he wanted to be. And, um, and step eight here, we're gonna get to the, the epilogue and, and it really came together at that point where my character who I had no expectations for ended up getting that, uh, that recognition in the course of the campaign. Um, items and uh, particularly magic items are, we're gonna talk a little bit about how to engage players with those. Uh, fantasy players are gonna wanna know what it looks like and, and a vivid description of how it works so they can get that visualization. And you don't necessarily even have to provide that if they're willing to, to do it themselves. If, if they can do with a picture and a description of how it works, roll with it. Um, but you could also provide that to help them to have that visualization. Narrative players are looking for items to, to be significant to the story. Uh, it can help to say who made it, what's the lore, what's the destiny. Um, items that grow with the players are great for, for narrative uh, focused players because the item becomes part of the story as much as the character is. Challenge players are looking for things that are tactically interesting. What's the, the resource limitations of this thing that I have here? What are the drawbacks of using this so that they can have more interesting decisions to make. And oh, and I should say, part of the reason items are such a golden opportunity here is that you can more or less control which character gets the item, right? If, if the, the challenge player is playing a fighter, you can give a magical sword that has um, these tactically interesting things planned in while giving a a vivid and um, visually appealing wand to the fantasy player who's playing a magic user. Uh, fellowship players are going to engage more with items when they complement um, something that somebody else has, right? I say brother items here, when they help them feel more connected with another player at the table. Discovery players are going to love items that have a mystery to unlock in them. Um, that, that can help them uh, give them a, yet another thread to try to follow as they realize that, yes, I have this weapon, but it's not all the way there. If there's something else about it that I haven't discovered. And then expression players is when you can give them an item that helps them do better what they're trying to do. We mentioned that during character building, an expression player is likely trying to, to do um, to express themselves through how they use the mechanics and the creation of that character. And it's probably suboptimal. But if you can provide them with an item that helps that character do what they're trying to do with their suboptimal character, it can help bring them back into balance and, and be a nod to what they were trying to achieve. Uh, in this case, I think of my bard barbarian multi-class who was given a book that let him effectively use um, bardic inspiration on himself in order to, to fight in the lead as long as he was doing his journal entries within that book and writing the stories of his heroic adventures. 
And then finally, we're going to talk about epilogues. So this is when we've come to the end of the campaign and we're letting the characters ride into the sunset and we want to use this opportunity to solidify the world in the player's minds, solidify the story so that they have an anchor that they can look back on to link them back to the campaign and remember their, their characters because they want to remember. And they also want to be able to, to have that moment of, well, what did my character do after this story? What's the part that we didn't actually get to play out? And so on this one, you can see I've left challenge and discovery blank at this point. It doesn't make a lot of sense for there to be a chance of failure as we talk out um, the, the um, sunset years of a character's life. Um, there's not a lot more left to discover as, as the campaign has come to an end. There's no nowhere else for the thread to go. The thread has come to an end. But we're going to talk about the other four. So fantasy players are going to enjoy a vivid description of their retired hero glory life or, or whatever their hero glory life is an example here, but whatever their, their characters they want to be, they're going to enjoy having that opportunity to, to really re visualize you know, what comes after the campaign. Narrative players are looking for how the campaign events impacted the world, right? What difference did it make? That, and it doesn't matter what the, the size of it is, right? If they saved the world, Okay, what does the world look like after it was saved? If they uh, discovered this ancient lost technology, what does the world look like now that that technology is back in the world? Um, so how, do, how does their player go on to have an impact in the world? It's going to matter to the narrative player. How does, why does our story matter in the end? Uh, fellowship players are going to just enjoy having a chance to, to work together as they make these things, right? Kind of bounce off, um, bounce off of one another as they go along, right? Intertwine their, their epilogues. And so part of that is not having each player go one by one, but having there be uh, kind of a turn order as you go through the players with their epilogues to to give everyone a chance to respond to each other is going to help the fellowship players. And then expression players, um, let them be the ones who define the details. I've done epilogues multiple ways, uh, sometimes with the, the turn based, as I was describing, where you say, okay, these 10 years, what did you do? What did you do? What did you do? Okay, next 10 years, you, 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 you. Um, and, and I feel like that's great for the fellowship and the expression ones because it gives them an opportunity to interact with each other as they go through this and and have a little bit more control. The other way that I've seen it done and that, that I've tried once was to get everyone to tell you what they think they're going to do with C in the epilogue, what their character's intentions are in the epilogue, and then pre-write it and read it ahead of time, as uh, pre-write it ahead of time and read it at the table as a, as an epilogue session before kind of a general discussion. And I feel like that better serves the fantasy and the narrative because you have a better plan of, of how it's going to go. But it does remove that interaction. And so I'm torn looking at this slide between uh, how I want to do epilogues in the future because I've enjoyed both myself. And that's all I've got on the aesthetics of play. Um, lots of places you can contact me, obviously, the comments of this video. Um, with any questions or comments, and thank you very much for watching. I know it's been a long one.